Morant with a running start. Elevate. Oh, oh, it does. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh. He's done. High game in overtime. Gasol will turn. into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took except Adams going long. Moran! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Moran gets 70! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win! Edition. My name is Keith Parrish. The Grizzlies defeat the Utah Jazz. They win a road opener for the first time since the franchise moved to Memphis. Ja Morant returned after only playing nine games last season and looked like one of the best players in the league. Santi Aldama scored 27 points. Zach Eady debuted. It did not go awesome, but most importantly, the Grizzlies get the victory on today's episode. Of course, I'm going to talk about that. Before I do, just a word. If you're going to buy League Pass, I love League Pass. I don't know how you're a big NBA fan without having League Pass, but if you haven't bought League Pass and you're going to this season, why don't you sign up using my affiliate code? The link will be in this episode's description. Of course, League Pass, you can watch any team that's not in your local market whenever you want. All the games are on demand. They have condensed games. It's very, very awesome. And right now, courtesy of our friends at Watch Playback, I have my own affiliate sign-up code. So if you're getting League Pass this season and you haven't bought it yet, sign up using my link that is provided in the description of this show. All right. What a game. What a wild, exhilarating game. Lots of things happened that were extremely, I think, unexpected. The The big bullet points, and I think the biggest takeaway, is John ja Morant looked amazing. John ja Morant had 22 points and 10 assists and 5 rebounds. Played just about 28 minutes. Now, one of the storylines of this game is the playing time. For everyone, the Grizzlies went 11 deep. Of those 11 players, they all played at least 13 minutes. That has only happened twice since Taylor Jenkins' rookie season for the Grizzlies. Taylor Jenkins' rookie season, he played 11 or more guys a lot. I mean, relatively a lot. It looks like, let's say, eight times, just eyeballing it. But the last two times the Grizzlies had 11 guys play in the same game and play 13 minutes or more each, Um, the 73-point win, the biggest win in NBA history, so a blowout over the Thunder where they cleared the bench, and then last season against the Jazz when the Grizzlies got destroyed by the Jazz. Another blowout. This was not a blowout. This was a competitive game, and they went with an 11-man rotation. Now, there's a few reasons that they did this. Taylor Jenkins was asked about it. A lot of it has to do with the schedule. First game of the season, you know, maybe you're at a higher risk for like a tissue injury or an overuse injury or something as people are ramping up, so they didn't want to overuse their best players. Also, they have three games in the first four nights. They got a back-to-back on Friday and Saturday. They have six games in the first nine nights. So because of that, they spread the wealth a little bit. Some of it also was foul trouble. Desmond Bain was in first half foul trouble. I, of course, really dislike it when my best players are benched with three fouls in the first half. That's not a thing you have to do. This is like a trope I go to every single season. I don't believe in fouling your own guys out. Like Desmond Bain ended up playing 27 minutes. He finished with four fouls. Taylor Jenkins believes the risk of picking up your fourth foul and thus being compromised for the rest of the game is much greater than your team getting smoked while your best players are on the bench. I disagree. I know like Mark Dagnall, he agrees with me. He doesn't believe in fouling your guys out is what I call it by removing them with foul trouble. Also, Zach Eady did foul out. Now, kudos to Taylor Jenkins allowing Zach Eady to stay in the game with five fouls early in the fourth quarter. Zach Eady fouls out of the game. But for whatever reason, lots of players played. Now, there have been previous 
season's end games where the Grizzlies were shorthanded. And then I was thinking, wow, we don't have that many great players available. Maybe they'll just play eight or nine. And for whatever reason, it feels like usually it's always a surprise where Taylor Jenkins is like, no, what if I play even more players? So 11 guys get in and basically everyone contributed. Everyone pitched in for this victory. There's no player in this game where you were like, what was that guy doing? I feel like the fan base is maybe the lowest on like John Conchar and Jake LaRavia just because they want Jalen Wells to get more minutes. Well, guess what? Jalen Wells was the first sub along with Scotty Pippen Jr. But like Conchar and LaRavia played well. Now the 11th man that we weren't totally expecting was Jay Huff. Jay Huff had an awesome game. Jay Huff was not someone I expected to be in the 10-man rotation. Now, if you asked me who should have played, if I were coaching and I'm picking a 10-man rotation, I actually would have gone with Jay Huff, and I probably wouldn't have played Scottie Pippen Jr. I would have sized up. I would have gone with bigger lineups. A lot of NBA teams, or several NBA teams I'm seeing already, aren't really playing a traditional point guard with their second unit. Well, Scottie Pippen Jr., he had a really good game. He got seven assists and three steals and a block. And by the way, they went double point guard four minutes into the game with Scottie Pippen Jr. and Ja Morant. Not what I would have done, but it's what Taylor Jenkins did. And you can say it worked out. It all worked out. And some of it probably worked out unsustainably. Like this lineup that they went to. And again, we're shorthanded. We know this. Jaron Jackson Jr. apparently going to miss the first two games. So Jaron Jackson Jr. is unavailable. Luke Kennard. One of your main subs, unavailable. Then Vince Williams Jr. still hurt. Gigi Jackson still hurt. But they played a lineup in the first quarter and also in the fourth quarter where it was Scottie Pippen Jr., Jalen Wells, Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark, and Jay Huff. That is madness. I mean, Santi at the three, which is... I mean, honestly, fine. He's just an offensive player, essentially, and he had an unbelievable game. But rookie Jalen Wells, freshly promoted two-way guy, Scottie Pippen Jr., two-way guy, Jay Huff. Like, there's no one in that lineup that can create their own shot. But guess what? Uh, Fun with numbers currently has a plus 110 net rating. I mean, it's only in a few minutes. But Jay Huff was cooking from deep. Thus, the Grizzlies won those minutes comfortably. So, a weird game. Now, it felt like this was going to be a comfortable win for a second there. The Grizzlies got up by 17 in the first half. But the Jazz erased that lead and actually took the lead in the fourth quarter. And it ended up being a nail-biting affair where the Grizzlies made enough clutch plays to come away with the victory. Now, the first quarter, this game started off with the Grizzlies launching three-pointers. Their first, I think it was first four field goal attempts were all three-pointers. In the first quarter, they took 22 field goal attempts. 15 of them were three-pointers. That's a massive number for any team. They opened the second quarter with back-to-back three-pointers by Marcus Smart. So that means 17 of their first 24 field goal attempts were threes. Now, some of the first quarter highlights, you had Zach Eady actually being involved in two of the Grizzlies' opening baskets. And Zach Eady, the big picture is underwhelming debut. Fouls out with five points and five rebounds only made one out of five free throws. That's going to be the big takeaway. But there were still some very good moments. Ja Morant's first basket of the season was off a Zach Eady, Ja Morant pick and roll. They went right to it. Ja got a three-point play. The next time they ran a Ja Morant, Zach Eady pick and roll, Ja Morant got into the lane, got to the basket, missed the shot, but Zach Eady got the rebound, got fouled, had a three-point play opportunity. So those were the good things right there. We see the screening from Zach Eady. He got the screen assist on that first shot. They didn't do that much screening, though. However, third quarter, 
First called play for the Grizzlies in the second half. Zach Eady sets a screen for Ja Morant, and when the defense reacts and moves, Desmond Bain rotates into the open space for a wide-open top-of-the-key three-pointer and makes it. So that, again, is offense created from Zach Eady pick-and-rolls. But in the first quarter, Eady had those good pick-and-roll plays with Ja Morant. Also, some of the highlights... After missing his first two three-pointers, Santi started draining them. He ended up making his next five three-point attempts, but he hit a few in the first quarter. Then, as Jalen Wells, again, first sub off the bench with Scottie Pippen Jr., I mean, that speaks to the hard work and the good progress that those guys made and the potential they showed in training camp and in the preseason that allowed the coaches to put them in first. It also speaks to the Grizzlies' stunning lack of depth but Jalen Wells checks in like four minutes into the game, immediately drains a three-pointer. He ends up hitting two three-pointers in the first quarter. Now, in the second quarter, that's when we get that first glimpse at that just bizarre lineup of Scottie Pippen Jr., Jalen Wells, Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark, and Jay Huff, and Jay Huff cooked. Jay Huff hits a three, then Scottie Pippen Jr., steals the ball, gives it right back to Jay Huff. He hits another one. Back-to-back threes. The next possession was a Brandon Clark floater. Brandon Clark, when he came into the game, maybe doing a little bit too much, maybe a little bit too much of a green light for Brandon in the new offense. He turns the basketball over when he gets the ball in transition and then tries to make a pass out to the corner. Then he misses a three-pointer. But we saw a very traditional Brandon Clark play, drove into the paint, hit his little floater. That Brandon Clark floater capped off a 13-0 to run. That's what gave the Grizzlies their 17-point lead in the first half. Now, some of the bad things in the first half and some of the things that plagued the Grizzlies throughout the game, they were getting whipped on backdoor alley-oops. And I think that was probably because of the number of inexperienced players the Grizzlies were using, and I think specifically the inexperienced front court players. They gave up lots of alley-oop dunks. So that wasn't great. But still, the Grizzlies held the lead in the first half. Then in the third quarter, it was still going fine, but eventually the Jazz got in an offensive rhythm. Jumping ahead to the fourth quarter, The Grizzlies were up by 13, 101 to 88, but then the Jazz went on a 14-1 run to tie it. Now, the last two seasons, losing fourth quarter leads, a bit of an issue. Now, last season, throw it all out. Weird season. But the year before, when they were good, they still had an issue, basically the last two months, three months of the season, of losing fourth quarter leads. Now, in this one... I don't think it's a big mystery. Some of the things they didn't do great, uh, they fouled way too much. They committed 14 fouls in the fourth quarter. Now, some of that, I think, was the referees calling way too many fouls. Just, it was a very sensitive whistle from the referees in this game one. I didn't get to see a bunch of other games on Wednesday night. I was hosting a watch party in Nashville, by the way. The watch party in Nashville was super fun. Lots of people out on a Wednesday night. Lots of people stayed late on a school night to see the Grizzlies pull out the victory. The people went nuts when Jay Huff hit his back-to-back threes. But it was a great watch party. But from what other games I saw when I came home and flipped around a little bit, referees were calling fouls everywhere. So maybe it wasn't just a Grizzlies-specific game. But the Grizzlies committed 14 fouls in the fourth quarter. And that's a fourth quarter where they led Almost the entire fourth quarter. The Jazz shot 20 free throws in just the fourth quarter. And they were trailing basically the whole time. That's astounding. But the Grizzlies were fouling too much. Also, they had no answer for Walker Kessler. Walker Kessler was dominating on the inside. Now, Zach Eady's first ever professional game was a summer league game where he put up a double-double against Walker Kessler in Salt Lake City at the Utah Summer League. Um, It was a much different story in this one in a regular season game. Walker Kessler had a monstrous game. Meanwhile, Edie only had the five points and five rebounds. Also, the Grizzlies weren't defending that well. I mean, yes, they were fouling, but like guys were driving right into the lane and scoring. And another issue in the fourth quarter was we're still 
being very cautious with the minutes. They were saving John ja Morant for games coming up. John ja Morant was amazing in this game, but only played 27 minutes. He checks out with nine minutes to go with the Grizzlies up by, I think, eight. And he doesn't check back in until there's four minutes left in the game. We're in a regular season game. There's five minutes left. It's a one possession game. And we have Jalen Wells and Jay Huff and Scotty Pippen Jr. all in the game. Now, there were big fourth quarter plays made by those guys. Scotty Pippen Jr. had a massive block on a three point attempt that ended up leading to a Desmond Bain breakaway layup. That put the Grizzlies up five with five minutes left. You had Jay Huff hitting a big fourth quarter three. But then once John Morant got back in the game with four minutes left, it was a little bit more traditional as far as who was making the big plays. You had Ja just abusing Cody Williams. I mean, the Cody williams Ja Morant matchup, that's a mismatch. Ja had an amazing reverse layup in the first quarter. Being guarded by Cody Williams, he picked Cody Williams' pocket for a three-point play in the second half. Then he hits just multiple impressive plays down the stretch. He gets a three-point play going against Cody Williams. Bain, after not getting many minutes in the first half, played his normal allotment of minutes in the second half down the stretch. He hit a big step-back three-pointer that gave the Grizzlies the lead back. And then... The next play after that is when Jay Huff hit his big fourth quarter three that put the Grizzlies up 110 to 105. The final few minutes were basically trading uh, clutch plays with fouls. I mean, Marcus Smart kept flopping down the stretch with the Grizzlies in the bonus. I call that referee roulette where you're gambling on the referee giving you the benefit of the doubt on a foul call as opposed to playing defense. When the other team's in the bonus... I hate referee roulette, but Marcus Smart kept sending the Jazz to the foul line, although Marcus Smart helped out with that circus shot he hit that put the Grizzlies up four. And then uh, with the highlight, the Ja Morant incredible move and finish in the paint, which sort of iced the game, put the Grizzlies up two possessions. They still needed a Santi Aldama offensive rebound and then some Desmond Bain free throws to ice the game. But still, a really solid win when you consider the context of the players available and the way the rotation was handled. If you're giving that many minutes to Jalen Wells in his first game, if you're playing Jay Huff, a guy most of you didn't know about until a few months ago. I mean, I barely knew about him. I just knew he was a big. I'd seen it Summer League a lot. Getting those contributions from those guys. By the way, Jay Huff ties his career high with three made three-pointers. And walking away with the victory is absolutely the most important thing. Now, let's run through some of these individual numbers. Let's talk a little bit more about Zach Eady. Yes, a tough game. Missed some finishable shots in the paint. Did not dominate on the glass. But like I highlighted The screen plays, those were scoring plays for the Grizzlies. He got an offensive putback in the second half. The big stat, this is, again, fun with small sample sizes. The big, brightest takeaway from this game, I think, for Zach Eady, is in the 15 minutes he played, the Grizzlies had a 43% offensive rebound rate. That is an unbelievably high number. Now, the Grizzlies did not defensive rebound that well in this entire game, but they got offensive rebounds when Zach Eady was in there. The Santi Aldama game. I mean, 27 points, five made threes. He was absolutely amazing. Now, one bit of Grizzlies news that I didn't cover and I didn't talk to Chris Harrington about in the previous episode, was just the fact that the Grizzlies didn't sign any of their players to extensions. We had the extension deadline pass last week. It was basically non-news for me because there was almost no chance no extension would get done. Like Bobby Marks reported, the Grizzlies are going to table extension talks with Jaron Jackson Jr. That's because there was no chance that Jaron Jackson Jr. was going to sign an extension based on Jaron's contract. They couldn't pay Jaron a competitive salary where he would even consider taking an extension. Now, the Santi Aldama extension 
Santi's going to go into restricted free agency, and that's because based on Santi's season last year, there was like no chance the Grizzlies were going to offer him I don't even think like the kind of contract that Moses Moody and Corey Kispert got, like $13 million a season, $15 million a season. With their hesitation to spend, with their worries about luxury tax, they weren't going to give Santi Aldama that contract. And also, based on what he did last season, I don't think he was deserving of that. Now, Santi Aldama, he's not going to sign for a number less than that. Since he's 23 years old, he thinks I'm worth that right now. If I get better, I'm going to make even more. So that's why the Grizzlies didn't sign him to an extension. Nothing the Grizzlies would offer would be a thing that Santi Aldama would accept. And right now, Santi is feeling pretty good about that decision. Game one, mission accomplished. An amazing game. He was one off his career high of 28. He kept up the three-point shooting after making 52% of his threes in the preseason he hits 5 out of 10 in this game. I mean, the Grizzlies hit 17 three-pointers. They finished with a 50% three-point rate, basically. 49.5% three-point rate, meaning half of all their field goal attempts were three-pointers. Now, they were at like a 60% three-point rate for most of the game. In the fourth quarter, they finally got in the paint. And I am sensitive to the fact that let's get in the paint a little bit more. But still, 17 out of 45 threes, and that's just the math of NBA basketball. The Jazz made 10 threes. The Grizzlies made 17. I mean, Jay Huff, Jake LaRavia, John Conchar, and Santi Aldama gave you 10 three-pointers. Meanwhile, Desmond Bain had four of the three-pointers. So, Santi Aldama, massive game. Also got two assists and five rebounds. I haven't, felt like, emphasized John Morant enough just because... I'm right now walking on clouds because of, yes, the win, but also that John Morant, I'm going to say it again, looked like one of the best players in the NBA again with his 22 points and 10 assists, only three turnovers. Now, Marcus Smart made some plays, also committed some fouls, also uh, missed some three-pointers, one out of six six from three-point line, so he has 11 points on 11 field goal attempts, makes all four of his free throws. The Scottie Pippen Jr. game, again, I was very impressed. Six points, seven assists, three steals, and a block. Jalen Wells didn't score after the first quarter, but six points, one assist, and a steal in his debut game. Brandon Clark did not play very much. Now, I think there's a few reasons for this. Um, the bad one is he wasn't that effective. Uh, he doesn't fit well maybe into what they're trying to accomplish as a team. Also, the fit with him is weird with the players who were available. Without Jaron Jackson Jr., none of it's ideal. He fits nicely with Santi, who ended up with 31 minutes of playing time. But, like, he, he doesn't fit great with Jay Huff or Zach Eady. Now, Jay Huff, it's a little bit more workable because of Jay Huff's shooting. But, the lack of Jaron being there is a reason why I think Clark's minutes were lower. And then just the overall, I think, lineup fit with Zach Eady and the guys available. That meant like LaRavia played a, a good bit of power forward. LaRavia had a pretty nice game. He made an open three off of some really good ball movement. He blocked Jordan Clarkson's shot. And then him and Marcus Smart harassed Clarkson out to the corner forced a turnover that was good to see so he had five points with the block and a rebound Conchar made his only field goal attempt had five points all of them in the fourth quarter he played 15 minutes and because of all of that the Grizzlies are now one and zero despite the nerve-wracking moments despite some lineups that if you would have asked me before the game I would have said Oh, that's going to be an abject disaster. Here are my uh, most concerning lineups based on uh, this game. Uh, let's say the one that had a plus 110 net rating, Scotty Pippen Jr., Jalen Wells, Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark, and Jay Huff. I would also call the Scotty Pippen Jr., Jalen Wells, John Conchar, Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark lineup. I'm, I'm going to call that a full-blown panic lineup again we were playing summer league lineups plus marcus smart or summer league lineups guys who played summer league last season i'm not insulting these guys i'm saying these players literally played summer league last season and here we are in game one 
in a close game and they're playing. There were some uh, cool lineups I liked. I, I really enjoyed Scotty Pippen Jr. and Jake LaRavia, those two bench guys playing with the starters, Marcus Smart, Desmond Bain, and Zach Eady. I was a big fan of that one. I liked the starters with Jay Huff in there. I mean, I guess one of the questions for the Grizzlies after the first game, and maybe it's a big picture question, is how important is Jay Huff? Is he always going to be that important? Is he going to be a better basketball player than Zach Eady in multiple games? Now, Zach Eady, again, I'm not concerned about this game. And I feel like some of you guys act like I have some kind of agenda against Zach Eady. I know almost nothing about Zach Eady. I feel like I've been clear about that. My skepticism of Zach Eady, it's very little to do with Zach Eady, and it has everything to do with the fact that rookies aren't normally very good. And centers drafted ninth aren't normally very good. So I'm like, his preseason stats, kind of underwhelming. His rebounding stats aren't that good. It's not that I'm predicting bad things for Zach Eady. I hope Zach Eady's amazing, because I want the Grizzlies to be good. My concerns are always, hey, we're penciling in Zach Eady to help us be a top four seed in the West. We're assuming Zach Eady's going to help us win a playoff series based on the way the front office operated in the offseason. We're planning on Zach Eady to help us win a playoff series. I am skeptical, not because of Zach Eady. I am skeptical because of the history of the NBA. Rookies don't do that. Also, lots of other rookies in the NBA, not great debuts. Risa Shea didn't do much. Rob Dillingham didn't play. Reed Shepard didn't do much. His team lost. It's hard to come in and be great as a rookie. Unless you're Jalen Wells and you step onto the court and drain your first two three-pointers. So going forward, is Jay Huff going to be this important to our success? Hopefully not. Hopefully once Jaron comes back, it'll be a little bit more calmed down. We'll get more Brandon Clark front court minutes. Edie's going to have better games than this, of course. This is likely the Nadir. I liked what I saw from him in this game. Just overall the stats and then the, the missing the free throws. You can chalk that up to nerves, hopefully. It's going to be, I think, a lot better for him. But if Jay Huff is this important, well, we're going to need to get him on a regular contract. Anyways, uh, the Grizzlies' next game, Friday night at the Rockets. The Rockets, somewhat surprisingly to me, lost their first game against the Hornets, so they're going to be desperate in that game. And then the Grizzlies' home debut is this Saturday against the Orlando Magic, and it's a throwback night. They're going to wear the Vancouver Grizzlies throwbacks. Sounds amazing. Can't wait to watch it. Anyways, if you want to support my show, do that at patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. Thanks to the two guys who signed up last night while I was at the watch party. Sorry, I haven't reached out to you yet. I was at the watch party and I missed the emails alerting me that you guys signed up. But thanks to Patrick N and Brent R who signed up for my Patreon last night. They wanted to join the Grizzlies Slack channel. We got Grizzlies fans in there talking about everything. It's like Twitter without any of the weirdos. So come join the Patreon. Also, if you join the Patreon, you get access to some bonus content. So patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. Also remember, if you want to sign up for League Pass, use the link in this episode's description. All right, hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz!